Today's video is going to be about some important electromagnetic properties. Um, this one specifically is about duality and image theory. These are the sorts of rules that in general govern how electromagnetic waves behave and have useful implications for the types of things that we might want to know about when we're doing antenna design. So let's start with duality. The very basic idea of duality is an important mathematical principle. If you have two systems that are described by equations that are of the same mathematical form, then the solutions are identical. A really, really basic idea um, example of this might be something like if we have two equations like this, x plus 5 equals 8, y plus 5 equals 8, guess what? x and y are both equal to 3. This is really basic, but in electromagnetics we have problems that involve electric current densities and the magnetic vector potential. And we also have problems that involve magnetic current densities and the electric vector potential. We haven't really done any videos about this, but it has all of the same type of equations and behavior as the magnetic vector potential does, just in response to magnetic current densities instead of electric current densities. I will tell you a little bit more about magnetic current densities later, because in reality they don't exist, but they're still a useful analytical tool for simplifying problems. So if our problems have electric currents in them, then the source is J. If they have magnetic currents in them, the source is M, the magnetic current density. And J is governed, governed by a couple of equations. The specific equations that um, have electric current density in them. So Ampere's law has electric current density in it. So it looks like this. I'm putting a little subscript A on the fields due to J because they are related to the magnetic vector potential here. And on the magnetic current side, we have a similar equation, but it's Faraday's law. And the other one of Maxwell's equations matches up in a similar way. So on the electric current side, we've got Faraday's law with no source terms in it. And on the magnetic current side, we've got Ampere's law with no source terms in it. And all of those things boil down into a wave equation that relates on the left-hand side the magnetic vector potential To the electric current density, and on the right hand side, the electric vector potential to the magnetic current density. The re relationships between the fields have the shape, same shape, so you can derive the magnetic field due to J from the magnetic vector potential this way, or you can derive the electric field due to M from the electric vector potential this way. And now I'm sure you're starting to anticipate how the forms of these equations are going to match up. So I can write an integral equation for the magnetic vector potential. 
volume integral over the sources j of r prime, because r prime is our source coordinates, e to the minus j k r minus r prime over r minus r prime. I mean, I am sure that you can guess what this integral equation looks like for the electric vector potential. So in general, anytime you're dealing with problems with electric sources in them and problems with magnetic sources in them, if the problems are of the same geometrical shape um, and they have the same boundary conditions and everything, then all of these quantities have sort of an equivalency table. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to write the equivalency, the, the terms for the um, electric problems. So that means that Electric currents are not zero, magnetic currents are zero. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to write the terms for the equivalent magnetic problem. So magnetic currents are not zero, and electric currents are zero. And if you have a problem that has both electric currents and magnetic currents in it, because of superposition, you can split it into two problems that just have one or the other. So in an electric current problem, you have Ea. The equivalent term in a magnetic current problem is HF. The magnetic field is equivalent to minus the electric field in a magnetic problem. J is equivalent to M. A is equivalent to F. Epsilon is equivalent to mu. You can swap out mu for epsilon. Here's where things get interesting. If you are dealing with the intrinsic impedance eta, that means that in the magnetic problem, you have one over eta. In the electric problem, if you have one over eta, you swap that out for eta. But the wave number is the same on both sides. So that is an interesting equivalency, but how does it really apply to things? For instance, what if you know the fields from, let's say, an infinitesimal electric dipole? You can substitute the variables, swap out all of these right hand, left-hand side variables for all the right-hand side variables to find out the fields from an infinitesimal magnetic dipole. They will have the same shape, but everywhere you had the electric field, you'll have the magnetic field now, and everywhere you have the magnetic field, you'll have the electric field. And since there's no such thing as a magnetic current, that is completely useless. Right? No. It turns out that a lot of types of antennas with negative space in them, so for instance, a loop of wire carrying electric current around a loop shape, is equivalent to a magnetic dipole. You can also have something like, let's say, a slot in a conductive ground plane, which also tends to carry currents going around it like this. That can also be equivalent to magnetic dipoles. So situations like this make it a lot easier to solve for because instead of having current that is flowing in a curvy shape that might not be very well contained, instead we can represent it as these more uniformly contained shapes of magnetic current that are all pointing in the same direction. So in that sense, magnetic currents are useful for their equivalencies with loopy shapes of electric currents. The second topic that I want to talk about today is image theory. Which describes 
How waves reflect off conductors. So everyone is familiar with the idea of a mirror. In general, conductors act like mirrors, but they have the added complication of polarization. Optical light in your everyday world is not polarized, so it's not especially relevant to you what direction the electric field vector is pointing. But in the radio world, we always know and we always care what direction the electric field vector is pointing. So we are a little bit more specific about our image theory than just mirrors. And it all stems from the boundary condi conditions for electromagnetic waves. The most important one that we're going to talk about right now is this. If you have an interface between two materials, the tangential components of the electric fields have to be equal. So let's say this is our boundary between two fields. We've got an electric field composed of, let's say, two components on this side, meaning that it's like, I'll get you a different color. Um, that might be our electric field vector. Oh, that would mean that this little vector has to point that way. Anyway, that's our electric field vector on one side. And on the other side, we might have a different electric field vector. Maybe it'll be like that. It has a longer component in the normal direction, but it has to have the same length component in the tangential direction because of this boundary condition. If these are our electric field vectors E1 and E2, that boundary condition applies. Now here's the key thing. Inside a conductor, The electric field equals zero. So how do we restate that equation if E2 has to be zero? Then we just have N cross E1, and let's move that minus sign over here, equals zero. So that means that the incident wave and the reflected wave off of our PEC have to add up so that at the boundary with the perfect electric conductor, this condition of having no tangential electric field is true. Image theory can be applied to a lot of different types of and shapes of conductors, but specifically for antennas, we care a lot about the case of a perfectly conducting infinite plane, a PEC plane. So if that's the boundary condition for some the, the boundary with a perfect electric conductor, the situation that we have might look like this. In antennas, we're interested mostly in infinitely large, perfectly electrically conducting planes. Image theory can be applied to a lot of other shapes like that, a lot of regular geometries um, can be treated with image theory, but in general, the most relevant one for antennas is a PEC plane because that is similar to the ground plane that's used for a lot of common antenna types, which are in the monopole family. In class this week, we are going to talk about the situation of having electric currents and magnetic currents in various orientations with respect to a perfectly electrically conducting ground plane. So these two are mag electric currents, and I'm going to use two arrows to denote a magnetic current like that. And that's going to be one of our activities for this week, is what does image theory and this boundary condition imply about different configurations of current in the presence of a perfect electric conductor?